At this time, I would like to introduce Colonel Michael T. McTighe, Commandant of the Adjutant General School. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 24th iteration of the Maud Leadership Lecture Series. I'd like to start by recognizing some of our special guests here today. Ms. Terry Maud, thank you for your continued support of the Leadership Lecture Series. Each time you travel here to be with us, it reinforces your dedication to our soldiers and the Army family. Thank you for your presence. We also have several other senior leaders in attendance. Brigadier General Beagle, Commander, U.S. Army Training Center in Fort Jackson. Command Sergeant Major Gann, Command Sergeant Major, U.S. Army Training Center in Fort Jackson. Command Sergeant Major Maynard, Command Sergeant Major, 81st Readiness Division. Colonel Ayton, Commander, Soldier Support Institute. Over the past year, senior leaders have made great strides in refocusing our Army on multi-domain operations in large-scale combat. Everything from our doctrine to our structure to how we train our soldiers has been examined and the Army has positioned itself for the next fight. In honor of Lieutenant General Maud and his love for soldiers, we routinely invite senior leaders to speak to our soldiers about leadership in order to foster stewardship of our military profession just as he did. Just as we have invested deeply in how we do business, it is critical that we invest in those who do our business, our soldiers. For this iteration of the Maud Leadership Lecture Series, we found no one better suited for this task than today's guest speaker. A career soldier with more than 30 years of service to our Army, Mr. Kevin Schwedo is no stranger to mentoring military leaders, nor Fort Jackson for that fact. In September 2017, Mr. Schwedo was invested as the South Carolina civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army. In this role, Mr. Schwedo assists in promoting good relations between the Army and the public and advising the Secretary on regional issues. Be it in military uniform or civilian attire, Mr. Schwedo has dedicated his life to defending and supporting soldiers, civilians, and family members. Please join me in welcoming to the stage the South Carolina civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army, Mr. Kevin Schwedo. Good afternoon. I, I hate these mics because I normally yell and they, they're forcing this one on me, but we'll go with it anyway. It is a great day in South Carolina. And if it's not a great day, great day, it's your own darn fault. Good Lord gave you every skill set to make it a great day for you and everybody you're supposed to be leading. Now I start with that because under Governor Haley, the late that appointed me to be the director of the DMV. Every state uh, leader was required to start every phone call with, it's a great day in South Carolina. And I found it amazing that so many people got wrapped around the axle about something simple like it's a great day in South Carolina. So I mean it when I say it because it is one of those things that really goes hand in hand with leadership. If it's not, it's because you as a leader failed and didn't make it a great day for you and everybody around you. Because people suck off of leadership. And we need to make sure we've got the right, uh, the right tools to go ahead and make people do great things. Now, before we get started, I want to thank Mrs. Maud for giving me an opportunity to come and spend some time with you today. Her husband's a very special man. We don't get much chance to go ahead and talk about it. I don't know if I've ever mentioned it to Mrs. Maud, but uh, I had the pleasure of having dinner with him uh, a little before the time that he passed. Uh, we were having a farewell for a four-star general by the name of General Tom Schwartz. And he sat right next to me for the dinner, and I got some amazing mentorship in just so much as a single meeting together at dinner time. And I think that's what I really love about this environment, because you with the Maud Leadership Lecture gives us an opportunity to mentor the next generation of leaders. And so just being a part of that is really, really special as far as I'm concerned. I also want to thank uh, uh, the CG and Sergeant Major Gann. General Beagle has been so great for this community, and I'm not sure the, the green suit community understands or appreciates 
what special pieces you bring to coming back. I think everybody knows you're a native South Carolinian. I think everybody knows that you were a Hall of Famer over there at SC State. What they may not know is that you are the first CG that hasn't just focused on the Midlands. You have gotten out to every community throughout the state. And you can't believe how important it is to go ahead and spread that among the, uh, the state. Because most people don't have an appreciation for the green suit mentality. If you get much away from the Midlands, or you get much away from Beaufort, or uh, Charleston Air Force Base, or Shaw Air Force Base, you don't see many soldiers. And it's huge. And so making that effort to get out routinely with as much responsibility you've got is greatly appreciated. And, and I'll throw Sheriff Lott under the bus. Sheriff Lott was supposed to be here today. Uh, I, I asked my first responders to please stand up for a second so that we can recognize them and give them a hand. where I give Sheriff a free plug. I don't know if you've ever seen the TV show, Live TV. But these are the guys that go out and participate, their teammates do in Live TV. And one of the reasons that I have started to love the show has more to do with their roots in the Army. Okay, if you've ever seen Addie Perez up there, Addie Perez is still a drill sergeant leader at the drill sergeant school. Sergeant Dave Brown was the guy that stopped me on Dixie Road for being a little faster than I should have as a tiny commander. Probably shouldn't admit that, but it's accurate. You can't, you can't have made your path. Okay? But we got you know, them from the Air Force, we got them from the Marine Corps, and many of those individuals are individuals that have come from your ranks. Which gets into how important is what you're learning in terms of leadership and responsibility in the Army. You can't have a real appreciation for how talented you are until you understand uh, you know, the responsibilities that you have had. It's amazing when, when Nikki Haley appointed her cabinet, she picked the director of motor vehicles. Retired military, the director of public, uh, excuse me, director of uh, employment workforce the Director of Transportation, the Secretary of Education, the Adjutant General of the Board, and I can go on and on and on, the uh, South Carolina Disaster Recovery Officer, all of them were retired military. Why? Because she knew she could get a job done. When she got to the South Carolina Disaster Recovery Officer, she went in, she goes, will you take the position? And the person says, you know, what am I going to say to my governor? She goes, that's what I love about the military. No is not in your vocabulary. The problem is, for most of us, your resumes suck when you get out. And I throw that out because I want you to think about that over time. You know, if you're an infantryman like Shueto, and you get out and you put on your resume, I kill people and I break things, don't expect the job. But I tell you that because... I have personally hired three of Fort Jackson's chiefs of staff, two of Fort Jackson's post sergeant major, and the Air Guard Command Master Chief. Why? As a favor? Not a chance. I am not that altruistic. I hired them because they were by far the most qualified people out there. I went so far as we have hired in the DMV over the last eight years over 100 soldiers under the VET Success Program. Again, not because I'm altruistic, because I know what skill sets you bring through leadership and responsibility to the table every day. We give you leadership responsibilities that most of you take for granted. I mean, if you ask the average infantryman, what are your job skills that relate to what I am, uh, you know, getting a, any job? If you don't start by talking about leadership and responsibility and the kinds of things that you've done in combat under the worst of conditions, you failed. We understate our capabilities and so all of it really does come down to leadership and that's really what I want to go ahead and start talking about is that leadership piece but before I do that a lot of what we learn in the military comes from our mission statement our vision statement I'm going to read it okay this is the current one from the Secretary of the Army the Army of 2028 will be ready to deploy fight and win decisively against any adversary 
anytime, anywhere, in a joint, multi-domain, high-intensity conflict while simultaneously deterring others and maintaining its ability to conduct a regular warfare. There is one word that has not been in our vision for probably 15 years. Anybody pick out what the word was? The word was decisively. Fight and win, decisively. That defines the resources that we provide anything. We, we decline, we went to the smallest force in the history of the United States because our vision didn't take us to any other place where it says being able to fight, you know, um, I forget what the exact term was, be able to fight uh, a contingency. There's a big difference between being able to fight and win a, conting uh, fight in, uh, a contingency and fight and win decisively. It takes you to a standard that you have with your soldiers to expect nothing more than the best. You want to so overmatch the enemy that you give them no chance at all. There is no such thing as a fair fight. And that means exacting standards. And that's what we're talking about with leadership. Do you have the ability to leech, coach, and mentor those individuals that are subordinate to you to get them to produce results that nobody else is capable of? So what we're going to do is we're going to right now go through a little game, a leadership game. And everybody's going to pay, pay, uh, play the game with me. Because if you don't, I will pick on you for the rest of this day. Okay, so I'm looking for you. I'm looking for you. So the game is like this. I want everybody to hold the OK sign over their head. Everybody, get it over your head. I'm looking. I'm coming around. Not over your head. We're starting with you. And I want everybody to say, I'm OK. I'm OK. That's lame. I'm OK. I'm OK. Everybody looking my way. I'm OK. I'm OK. Now put the OK symbol right on your chin. People, that is not your chin. That is your chin. That is your chin. Why did we do that? As leaders, nobody cares what comes out of your mouth. Not a soul cares what you say. They're all looking at what you do, and they're going to go ahead and emulate what you do. How did I learn this? As a young company commander in Germany, we used to go on alerts to the inner German border with frequency. And you had two hours from the time the alarm went off to be on the road ready to go to war. The first, war, all, the first hour, all you did was set things on up, get ready, everything your armor personnel carries from ammunition to food to uh, PLL, the whole nine yards. At the one hour point, the company commanders did a PCI, a pre-combat inspection, and they went from point A to point B to make sure their soldiers were ready to break out the back gate and you had a little time to react to anything that you may have missed. So you, everybody was gone by two hours. Well, one of the things that we were responsible for before we left the gate was to camouflage up. And anybody that's ever been a soldier knows there's only one way to camouflage on up. There is the infamous, you know, uh, uh, dark stuff on the high points of the face, light stuff on the low points of the face, but there's one army standard. Well, I'm ready in the air, I'm going there, I'm a brand new company commander, and I get around and I've got a brand new company commander who happened to be a West Pointer. And this West Pointer had just graduated from Ranger School, so I know he was locked in tight. I get down to his platoon, and the first thing I see is the platoon leader. And this kid, instead of having the standard Army camouflage pattern, I don't know who he did it, you know, followed it in Ranger School, had tiger stripes. Tiger stripes. So what do you think I saw on every one of his soldiers' faces? You're all wrong. First thing I saw was some kid with a peace sign. Another kid looked like Kiss with a star over his eye. Why was that? Every kid in that platoon saw the leader deviate from the standard, and they knew they had the authority to do the same. Leadership begins with you. Where did I see it most recently? One of the things that I really enjoy doing is what they call the law enforcement torch run. And we run from the state capitol to literally the Solomon Center in support of the Special Olympics. If you want to have an appreciation for leadership, watch what happens. And I've watched several commanding generals do it. We get into the back gate, 
will start dry, you know, running. The CG is usually leading the formation because he's leading by example, and he'll see a piece of trash on the side of the road. Without saying a word, he runs out of formation and picks the trash up. All of a sudden, you get about a half mile up the road, and there's a second piece of trash. The CG picked that one up, too. What do you think happened from that point forward without anybody speaking a word? Everybody was picking trash. Sergeant's major flying out of the formation, soldiers flying out of the formation, because they saw the leader doing what was important. When it comes to PT, you know, you can play this game, PT's important, but if you're not out there whooping everybody's butt in your platoon, your company, your battalion, PT ain't important. You've got to define what's important. If you're a parent and you've got kids, and you tell your kids, don't ever go out there and drink and drive, if you have one beer, one beer in front of your kids and drive, what do I promise you is going to happen with your kid? They are going to get out there and drink and drive as well. Because you all define the standards. If you understand what I started this whole piece with, which was individual responsibility, you will understand how critical your single role is as a leader. We're looking at what you are and what you do each and every day to set the standard for everybody around you. And if you're not, you're a hypocrite, and those soldiers talk about hypocrites. Junior leaders, I know we've got a bunch of lieutenants over here. I'm stealing a line from a guy by the name of General Barry McCaffrey, who at the time was a retired four-star general, and he was uh, one of the president's, uh, 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 what do you call it, the czar on drugs. But he was talking to the lieutenants, and he walked up to them, and he's doing just what I'm doing, walking around with a mic, and he says, Lieutenants, you are by far the best trained, most skilled, most educated, transportation corps in the history of the world. I don't want that to give you a big head. I'm going to give you a direct order. I'm still a four-star general. He's pointing at his shoulders with nothing there because I'm giving you a direct order. He goes, I do not want you to think for a second when you arrive at your first platoon that you are the smartest guy in that platoon. You're not. You pull out the personnel record of everybody in your platoon and you know it like you know your family members. And you're going to find out that there's a spec four over there with a master's degree. You're going to find out that there's somebody that just learned through the school of hard knocks. You're going to find more combat experience in that organization than you could gain in a lifetime. And if you think that you are going to have all the answers and not depend upon that talent, you are going to fail yourself, your platoon, and the entire United States Army. There's a time and a place for everything, and you've got to know when you're learning or mentoring, and there's a fine line between the two. But if you are not open to discussion with your subordinates, maybe you shouldn't be leading. It doesn't mean that there's not a right, and a, play, a, right, a right time for direct action. But if there's time available, you've got an opportunity to go ahead and learn some amazing lessons from some amazing people. The other thing has to do with initiative. Most people don't know when it is proper to take initiative, or in many cases, what initiative looks like. Company commander tells his platoon leaders, or a first sergeant tells his squad leaders, brand new squad leader, I want you to go ahead and take initiative. Does he know what that means? Not necessarily. They'll do something just to do something. But if you're smart, you will think of initiative like a tow missile. I'm probably dating myself out, but tube, tow missile. You know, tube launch, uh, yeah, wire guided, that's the W, uh, optically tracked. Tube launch, optically tracked, wire guided missile. If it has a set of binoculars on it, if you keep the crosshairs on, you know, this center of my tie, it will go 3,750 meters and hit exactly my tie. However, if that wire guide, excuse me, the wire breaks, anybody want to tell me where that missile will go? 
Answer is, anywhere it wants to. We were out at Graf and Veer, the wire broke, we're having a brigade tow competition, and that bloody missile started coming back at us. Did I tell you it was a tank killer? What did I do? I jumped under a darn tank. Okay, thank God it bottomed out and it blew up before it got back. The point becomes, with regards to initiative, your command guidance system is commander's intent. You've got to know what the commander's expectation is for you. And you've got to think, if he or she were not here right now, what would he or she expect me to do? And then you give orders in concert with that commander's intent. If you don't understand the commander's intent, you're not spending enough time with the commander or the first sergeant or the sergeant major. When three things break down in combat, as they inevitably will, all operations orders what? Shift at the line of departure. If they shift at the line of departure and you're constantly having to take the initiative, if everybody is focusing on the commander's intent, you will all end up on the objective at the same time and you will all end up there successful. So understanding the difference between true initiative and blind initiative is one of the most important things that we will do. I'm going to transition now to my you know, mid-grade leaders, captains, first sergeants, that kind of thing. Why is it with every mission you get, we want to start from anew? Every mission we get, we're going to start from the very beginning and we're going to roll it right on out. You know, I, all I hate to think, I, you know, there's a uh, Green Bay Packer Packers analogy, probably not appropriate at this point in time, but, you know, Vince Lombardi lost one of his few football games, and he got over there, and he's mad as a, as a, as a dog can be, and he goes, there's no way we should lose this game. No way. He goes, obviously, we need to start at the beginning. He reaches down to the football, goes, he goes, gentlemen, this is a football Jerry Kramer, the center, said, would you go over that again, coach? We don't necessarily need to quite do that. What do we need to do? I'm going to start by asking a, an interesting question in here. Please put your hand in the air. If you are a graduate of West Point, Annapolis, of the Air Force Academy. Nobody that will admit it. Okay, a couple that will admit it. All right, do you know what the difference between these guys and the rest of us are? We learned to plagiarize four years earlier than they did. <laughs> Why do I tell you that? We have been doing the same thing since the dawn of time. Why do we have to start anew? Why aren't we stealing good concepts from other organizations and building upon that? We're not competing against each other. When we go into battle, I want my team and my right, uh, my right and left to have amazing capability. Because together, we'll get things done. I mean, if you take a look at uh, probably the greatest basketball player to ever play the game, which was Michael Jordan. When Michael Jordan started going down that court, there wasn't a person in the league that could stop him. So what did they have to do to compete with the Bulls? They had to shut him down with either two or three people. Now, Jordan, if he was focused on his stats, probably still could have scored. But why were they so dominant? He would just dump it to anybody that was open and they would score and they would win. It's teamwork. You're not in it for you, you're in it for the whole team. Why is it that we have ill productive contests within the Army when we all ought to be focused on the same goal? So when I talk about stealing good ideas, I work for a guy by the name of General Van Antwerp. And as a West Pointer, three star, he hated that expression. Okay, but he came up with one that I like even better, so I'm going to share it with you. Good organizations steal great ideas shamelessly. I'll say it again. Good organizations steal great ideas shamelessly, but great organizations share great ideas selflessly. And there's a difference between the two. I expect you to steal those good ideas shamelessly. But I also expect you to help your buddy and to allow them to learn from both the good and the bad of everything that you've gone to the school of hard knocks for. 
because that makes us a greater, a more powerful army. This one's for the senior leaders. This is one to where I will probably get in trouble. This is, you know, the, I, I, I probably should have said at the very beginning. I don't expect every late leader to use the leadership tactics that I'm using. What I want to do is all I want to do is cause you to go out and to compare notes and find out what's going to work for you. Because some of the things I'm going to say are always going to be a little controversial. You may not even like what I've got to say, but if I force you to talk somewhere after this to find out what it's going to do to make you a better leader, we win. Heck, you can learn great leadership techniques from failing leaders if you just learn how to not do it like them. So what I want to do is I want to throw some of the best advice I got as the deputy commander. Commanding general walks in and says, Shwedo, your only job in life is to take care of soldiers. Let me repeat that. Your only job in life is to take care of soldiers and family members. Shwedo, if you've got to break a policy or an SOP, in order to take cold chair soldiers, do it, I've got your back. If you have to violate a regulation to take the air soldiers, you do it, I've got your back. Then he starts thumping me on the chest. Shwedo, but when it comes to a law, I want you to ask yourself one question. Is it punitive? And if it's not, take care of the darn soldiers and family members. He was a man of his word. And the focus was getting soldiers training materials and getting families quality of life things to take care of. That became a commander's intent program. It was never abused. Never abused. Because there's also a thing called the law of legitimate dissent. What does that mean? You have an obligation to follow whatever order you have been given, period, end of report. You may not like it, but you've got to follow it, unless it meets one of three criteria. criteria. If the law is illegal, immoral, or unethical, you have an obligation to not only refuse to do it, but to inform the person that gave you that order that it was illegal, immoral, or unethical. And if you can't do that, shut up, move out, and do what the commander told you to do. In this case, we never really tried to do anything illegal, immoral, or unethical. We tried to identify the commander's climate and stay within that time. The point becomes, we have an obligation. We're given rank to take care of those people that serve underneath us. It's not for your self-aggrandizement or anything else you take a look at what the commander's intent was, was to create the world's best soldiers and to keep families together. Because what did he know? The same thing that hasn't changed in, in years. We know that, for, for example, Fort Jackson out in the training base, our drill sergeants are coming out of combat theaters of operations. They're working 18-hour days, five to six to seven days a week. And where are they going when they get back? Straight back into a combat environment. They're going to go, they're going to be separated from their family as they go to a CTC rotation before they go on a deployment. And if you understand how important it is to get them world-class training, hold them accountable to a specific standards while taking care of their family members, we'll continue to be the greatest army in the history of the world. But it all comes down to leadership, and that all falls down on your back. Now, it's very interesting. We talk about personalities over here. I think I was going to pick on a sergeant major over here. Where is the sergeant major? Stand on up. There's one back here that was hiding. Well, yeah, you go ahead. Sergeant Major Gann, we'll get you over here. You know this deal. Come on, we've had this discussion. So if Sergeant Major Gann walks into General Beagle's office at the end of the day and sits down, good day or bad day? Good day or bad day? Answers, it's a great day. 
They're communicating. They've actually gone in two different directions, and they are sharing ideas that will make soldiers better. Let me give you the alternative to that. Sergeant Major Gann walks into General Beagle's office, but in the process of walking in, pulls the door behind him. Good day or bad day? <laughs> He's getting ready to dump everything he couldn't solve on General Beagle's lap. Why do I mention that? Because many people don't leverage the capability that comes from a command team. Does anybody know, go ahead, sit down, Sergeant Major. Anybody know where the most dangerous place is on any military installation? Anybody know the most dangerous place in any military installation? If you say any any, anything other than the little bit of free space between the commander and the Sergeant Major and the commander and his first sergeant, you're wrong. That's got to be a bond that exists, that takes care of soldiers, they're focused on the same things, and that's leadership. I know that whatever comes out of the sergeant's major's mouth has already been synchronized with the commander, if they're talking. It allows you to function seamlessly. It's where some lieutenants don't get it periodically. Tank Sergeant Major will show up, he's trying to save a lieutenant from doing something stupid, and he refuses to do it because he perceives himself as senior to somebody else. People, you've got to know when you're in a learning environment and when somebody's just stomping like they got tried to give you the test answer when you're back in school. They're there for a purpose. There is no sergeant major that gets up in the morning and says, what can I do to screw the unit up today? Their only function in life is to get you off your butt and to perform to a specific standard, and it's only because the commander and the sergeant major cannot be at the same place at the same time if they want to have the greatest impact. Do you know why training at Fort Jackson is so much better than the rest of the Army? Now, I can say that. Before I came here as the deputy commander, I was responsible for evaluating all the training and trade -off. I have been for four years to every basic combat training site in all of the services, all of the services, Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force, and Coast Guard. Okay? Why is it so special here? Because this is the only installation to where the Commander and Sergeant's Major only focus is on soldiers and training. At Fort Benning, you know, they've got uh, you know, the, the, the Ranger Battalion, Airborne School, uh, 3rd Brigade of 3rd Infantry Division, um, a whole bunch of other things that compete for their time. Even at, four, at excuse me, Paris Island, what is over 50% of the commanding general's mission at Paris Island? What'd you say? Recruiting. He is the recruiting commander for everything east of the Mississippi. When he's out of the training, either one of them, they are focused on making you better and they're focused on seeing what resources are available to train our soldiers to standard. Because I will tell you, for a commander to be effective, or a sergeant major to be effective, it's just like the chaplain school, the famous words, ministry of presence. The chaplain ain't out there, and the commanders ain't out there, we got an issue. Which is, and I, I'm deviating from the standard script, but I will tell you, one of the greatest combat multipliers of all times is the chaplain. Okay, if all he does in the IET environment is sit around and give away lickies and chewies while counseling at night, the real effective ministry ain't taking place. When they're down, round, down range and life is miserable, nothing but the suck coming out of everybody's soul, the chaplain can bring some spirit to the lunch of soldiers that really need it. And to miss that opportunity is a crying shame. All right, having realistic expectations is also important. One of the more important things you do. Um, back when I was at the University of North Carolina, okay, we were the number 10 team in the country in football. We played um, Nebraska, which was the largest team in college football at that time. Largest team in football, they were bigger than the pros. Just as we're preparing to go, the alumni fired the entire coaching staff. Why? 
because they did not like three yards in a cloud of dust. It gets you to number 10 in the country, but that ain't good enough. I will never forget my defensive back coach, and I'll clean up this expression right a bit, throws his clipboard on the ground as soon as you find out. He goes, you know, if fans were only half as successful as they expected their coaches to be, they'd all be blankety-blank millionaires. The corollary to that is, if we were hold, held to the same standard, we expect our coaches to be held, none of us would have jobs. Why do I mention that? When you're establishing standards, you are looking for the strengths and weaknesses of every soldier in your unit and how to build upon them. And if it's three yards in a cloud of dust, you ride it as long as you can. If it's not and it's something else, it's because you know your unit like you know your family. The next one has to do with another controversial one. This one will probably get General Beagle to ring me around the neck. Okay, but as far as I'm concerned, got any lawyers in here? Nobody will admit that, okay. As a commander, you should never, ever, ever accept the first no from the legal team. Never, ever, ever accept no from the legal team. Their job is not to take the easy way out. It never was, it never should be. You send them packing immediately, and you say, you, get, you know, General Counsel, do you know what a target board looks like? Every time you come in, you give me the darn bullseye. There's no risk in the bullseye. You walk right out, and you draw me every concentric line of risk until it becomes illegal. And then you tell me what I need to do to mitigate the risk so I can make a decision where I'm going to implement that strategy. Because we ain't going with no. We are so afraid of legal guys that we're, we're afraid to challenge them. Force them to do their job and tell them you want it back before midnight. But I've got something else to do. Well, he never has anything else to do. Force him to do his job, and when he starts sending him back regularly and tell him you want it by midnight, he'll start doing his job. And his job is to take care of the commander and the soldiers he's supporting. It's not to say no. Time to eliminate prejudice in our ranks. This ain't what you think it is. This ain't what you think it is. When I talk about prejudice, if you've ever been deployed, you come back and you start bad-mouthing the Marines, Air Force, Navy, Coast Guard, the whole nine yards. You start bad-mouthing, you know, depending on what component you are, active guard or reserve. Let's go back to the earlier message. You're all on the same team. We're always going to be short players, and we're only as good as the weakest link, and I will tell you, none of them is weak. You take a look at our non-commissioned officer corps, it doesn't exist anywhere else in the Army the way it exists here. You take a look at our, our, our uh, guard and reserve, nobody's at a higher level of, of readiness. And it's in, we may have fun from face to face, for example, in a bar, but our job is to create that one component, that one service, because every service comes with its own unique capabilities that none of you can win without. And so you've got to eliminate the prejudice, and as leaders, we've got to find ways to go ahead and incorporate the guard, the reserve, the active component, and the other services every time we can because we all, all operate in our unique ground space. Heck, we don't have enough soldiers to go ahead and send into combat today. We have to depend upon the Navy and Task Force Marshall up there at McCready to fill Army positions. So we bring them here to learn basic combat training techniques because we need them and you're going to need them for the rest of your careers because you're never going to have enough resources. So until you eliminate the prejudice and figure out how you're going to go ahead and make the team successful, we fail. I'm going to ask you guys a question. It's rhetorical, and I'll follow it on up. Do you have the guts to tell the boss what he needs to hear instead of what he wants to hear? Sergeant Major is just immediately popping in. I believe you, Sergeant Major. But the fact of the matter is, is I want to go ahead and share a little story with you. MTV, everybody's familiar with MTV. How many of you know about 15 years ago, MTV was going to 
was running out of business. They were running out of business. They couldn't figure out what was going wrong. So you know what they did? They did something that most people consider smart. They went out to their focus groups of kids that watch MTV, and they asked them the question, what is it that you would change to make this a great TV station? And you know what the result of that was? They failed even worse. Why? Because today's youth group tells people what they want to hear instead of what they need to hear. What did they do that caused the system to get turned around? They went up to these college kids with a $100 bill, and they said, we want to spend one hour in your dorm room. We're going to go through your trash, we're going to go through your drawers, we're going to look on your computer to see what's in the bit bucket out there, what's on, you know, what, what, what's, what, uh, uh, what sites you have visited. At the end of one hour, we're gone and you got $100. As a result of that, they found out what kind of clothes kids were wearing, what they were eating, what their interests were. But the point becomes, poor decisions are made based upon poor information. Leaders have to be able to communicate with their senior leaders, and you can't afford to placate the leadership team. We have an obligation within the law enforcement community. I'm going to pick on you guys right now. South Carolina has some of the worst DUI laws in the state. Why? Because we've got legislators that go ahead and write laws that will go ahead and get them uh, you know, tons of money. We had 25,000 DUIs on average every year in South Carolina. And at $10,000 a pop, it's a quarter of a billion dollar business. Those laws are written by legislators who get rich on that process until the blue suit community grabs together and says, we're not going to tolerate it anymore. This is what we need to get our, our, street, uh, excuse me, our uh, uh, street safe. We're not going to win that one. And money is going to continue to talk. Now, I'm not picking on my blue seat guys because every one of these guys gets it. And I have this conversation in 16 law enforcement networks virtually every year. Communication is what I was talking about is important. And most people don't realize how important. I was actually the active duty aide to a retired four star as a young captain, a guy by the name of Bruce Clark. And he's the history of the engineer, uh, he is the, uh, you know, uh, the, the grandfather, if you will, of the modern engineer corps. He was responsible for the, uh, uh, the engineering operations at Bastogne. And he's talking to a basic course and he said something we'll never forget. And so he goes, lieutenants, and he could be company commanders, battalion commanders, sergeant major, whole nine yards, we've all written an operations order. And he goes, I'm going to force you to think. He goes, how many of you believe that writing an operations order means writing something that everybody can understand? Every hand went up in the air. And he goes, well, then you're all stupid. Because it's not writing an order that can be understood. It's writing an order that cannot be misunderstood. And there's a huge difference in how we articulate particularly when lives are on the line. If you leave any guesswork into the way you communicate with subordinates and it's important, you have failed. Now talk about realistic training because I think that that's important. Okay? Um, when we talk about realistic training... I'm going to start by using what I will call the Marine model. What is it that Marines use at Paris Island and Marine Corps Depot San Diego to go ahead and, and create, quote unquote, a realistic environment for their soldiers? Everybody in this room knows the answer. Do they yell? Is that what they do? They focus on just leadership through fear. All right, I'm going to pick on, uh, whatever, let me see who I'm going to pick on over here. Sergeant Major, stand up. If I come at you right now, 
and I start yelling at you at the top of my lungs for the next five minutes, what will you do at the 40-second mark? Probably start laughing, or, yeah, that's probably probably accurate, or you're going to tone me out, yes or no. So when I'm going ahead and I've got that great shark attack going on, do you really think it accomplishes much? If there was a reason for me getting attacked, then probably. But we create these artificial events that have almost no impact on us, Okay. Stress inoculation is where the army went. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Miss Maud to stand up with me now. And we're going to go ahead and talk about realistic stress inoculation training. Anybody recognize what these are? Okay. These are what you start an IV with. I'm going to teach two lieutenants right now how to start an IV in their buddy. And Mrs. Maud's going to walk back with me and pick those two lieutenants. Okay. We're not going to go for volunteers. We're just going to pick on the ones that look like they've got fear in their eyes. All right, stop. Go back. <laughs> I did that intentionally. I'm not going to force anybody to do it. But in basic combat training for years, you did not graduate unless you could start an IV in your buddy's arm and your buddy could start one in your arm. I watched blood fly because they couldn't get in the right part of the vein. It happened virtually every time. Was it realistic training? Was it training that we would expect the soldier to be able to do in combat? If it is, then we're focused on the right thing. Three dash, you know, I'm, I'm assuming Trade Doc 350 6 still says to make the, 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 the pressure between the, uh, the soldier and the task and not necessarily the drill sergeant and the task. There's a reason for that. Create the right impediments. I mean, we do the same thing with basic combat training and gender integrated training. So I'm going to go ahead and take you through gender integrated training, why I love it and why the Marines are being forced to do it now. Is it the right thing to do? Yes. Why? Because if you're going to fight gender integrated, you better train gender integrated. If you're going to eliminate prejudice, you do it right here in basic combat training. You do it right here in the schoolhouse so it doesn't exist when you get to the unit. Does that mean doing everything together? Yes. I'm going to go back to my age, you guys. You haven't been here, you know, to see basic trainee. Does that mean every task is done together? Let me give you an example. Do you believe that in basic combat training we have men taking on women with pugil sticks? You do. Yes, we do. And I will tell you, I am, and this will be wasted on most of you, Karnak the Magnificent. I can tell 90% of the time who's going to win the three bouts in, in, uh, in the pugil training. 90% of the time, who wins the first bout? Somebody said men, somebody said women. The answer is the women do. Why? Why? What's going through the, uh, the guy's mind? I have never hit a female. I've been taught my whole life to never hit a female, and she couldn't hit me if she wanted to. What's going through the female's mind? I'm going to kick his butt. <laughs> All right. 90% of the time, the guy is shocked. You get to the second bout. 90% of the time, who wins that fight? The guy. Why? He's never been more embarrassed in his life and usually hits her so hard she comes off her feet. Now I can pick with 100% accuracy who's going to win the third fight. Anybody want to guess? I've heard male, I've heard female. You're both wrong. You look into their eyes, figure out which one is most pissed off, and that one's going to win 100% of the time. The point becomes... Do you want to learn that lesson at Fort Jackson or on the streets of Fallujah? We've done things in this environment to make it realistic training. When we, when we stood up the initial warrior tasks and battle drills, we started saying we are going to go ahead and take all the weapons out of the arms room on the sixth day of training and they're not going back until graduation. People were losing their minds. We put clearing barrels in front of them. Every time you left the Potomac area, you locked and loaded. Every time you got around a clearing barrel, you had to clear your weapon. 
And any time that you had a negligent discharge, the drill sergeants lost their minds because they had a real incident there and had their little swearing match with the soldiers. Do you know what reports we got out of the combat theater of operations for doing that very simple thing? Negligent discharges had dropped to almost zero. And the question from the guys in the field was, what can you do now about the officer corps? So we put it into Bolick. The point becomes, the next one was, where were we getting most of our, 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 our deaths? Now I'm going to go to some of the guys that have been in the military for a while. I'm going to go back about 10 or 15 years. About 10 to 15 years, what was the most dangerous road in the world? Route what? Right, Irish? Why? Because you were either getting ambushed or hitting IEDs the whole way. And all of a sudden, somebody said, we need to create a convoy live fire exercise using live fire ammunition in basic combat training. Every drill sergeant across the spectrum at all five major training centers said what? We're going to get somebody killed. We went through the risk mitigation efforts, we stood it on up, and we had soldiers shooting off the right side of the truck, left side of the truck, dismounting the truck, and assault maneuvering through an objective. And the entire time we did it, how many soldiers were hurt or killed with ammunition? Zero, or I wouldn't be saying it right now. My point is that you can control the standards and mitigate the risk if you're willing to do something on behalf of all soldiers in combat. I'm going to go ahead and just wrap up and talk to you about what I call the liar-cheater theory. There are two parts of this one. Number one, a lot of people worry about what comes out of the TRADOC environment. Because if you're wearing a uh, recruiter badge on your left pocket, what do most people think that you're doing? Lying. You're the liars. Okay, if you're wearing that patch on your right, that right is what? A drill sergeant patch? Makes you a cheater. So, or lying cheaters. They're sitting next to each other. Here's what everybody needs to understand about this environment. Recruiters have quality points that they can't bring people in on. Unless they meet a certain quality standard, they can't. And nobody expects every soldier to come in to be perfect. And when the training base expects perfection, they are kidding themselves. Their job is to get them to the training base and train them. What does every drill sergeant say? You gave me crap, but on graduation, I turned every one of them into a superstar. And then AIT gets them, and they say, Oh my God, look at the stuff they gave me from basic training. But magically, mysteriously, the AIT, they're all superstars until they get to the unit. And when they get to the unit, they all suck again. Do some of them slip through? You look at the tra basic training, drill sergeant to soldier ratio. The best ratio you'll ever get is 1 to 20. Most cases, it's either 1 to 30 or 1 to 60. Can you weed out all the bad ones? The answer is no. Are some going to slip through? Yes. Does the system expect it? Yes. What is the, what is the lowest sized unit in the Army? Squad? Team? Go with team. Okay. You got one NCO and three to four soldiers. If one guy slips through because he's a dud, what is the NCO to dud ratio when they end up in their first unit? One to one. Is there any NCO in the Army that can't deal with one-on-one -on -one in that one? Because his other rest of the peer group doesn't want him there anyway if he's sort of a dud. The point is that we've gotten it right. We still produce the most qualified, best-trained soldiers in the world, and you can't go. My only job today was to challenge your thought process. I don't care what you think, what you use in the grand scheme of things, if I can get you talking about leadership and what's going to make you, your unit, and your soldiers better 
at the end of the day. What you need to know is since 1986, the military has been the number one most trusted institution in America. Every time except for three times to where we were tied for first. Those three times, Ollie North lying to Congress, Tailhook, and Aberdeen. What happened in all three of those cases? We violated our core values. But in every case, we came back the next year and we were number one by ourselves. Three times in 23 years, the America has placed you, the confidence in you, above the confidence that we have in even our clergy and churches, which gives me pause. I don't necessarily like that. You know, in my mind, uh, I'm a great believer in faith-based uh, opportunities there, but the point becomes the American public trusts you, they love you, don't listen to any of the, uh, you know, the nimrods out there that don't ever understand you. But you're leading this great nation into greatness, and you're the reason that we have the kind of country we have, the best trained, most, uh, most best trained force in the world today. And you're doing something that 99% of America has not been willing to do, and that is to defend their nation and be prepared to put their life on their line. And if you're a leader, you have an obligation to give them the best leadership possible and lead them to greatness. Because in every generation, my, the guys that trained me, the Vietnam vets, they called us weak. And we called the, uh, the Cold War guys weak. And the Cold War guys called the uh, uh, Desert Shields, Desert, Desert Storm guys weak. And then we had the OIF, OEF guys weak. You know what is the one common denominator? In every case, in every case, we've had the best, most qualified, best-led army in the world, and that ain't going to change. So I appreciate an opportunity to spend some time with you out here and be glad to take any questions or anything you may have.